Masters of Divinity. Um, I am this time's moderator, Father Chuck. And with me is Father Fun. We Episcopalians have taken over the podcast. We have pushed out Matt and JP. They're done. It is like Doctrine of Discovery, English Empire. Like we're here, man. We're here. You gotta get. You better get used to it. Doctrine of Discovery. <laughs> um, and this week we are here to talk not about music because music mayhem's over. We. We uh, we had the last week had the Wheel of Mayhem where we talked about Katy Perry's um, Katy Perry's um, uh, Teenage Dream album, mm -hmm. and um, and it, it it was an episode. It was an episode. I will say that um, I've never heard my wife laugh at something as much as she did when she was listening to that this morning. Um, oh, nice. She she came up to me and she goes, she says she said she paused it and she and she said, I just got to the part where. Charles pointed out the fact that you guys started with uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit and that you finished with Teenage Dream and your reaction was so funny because you just go, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so it was it was an episode and I think it ended up it ended up being an episode, you know? Well, since you brought your wife up, I do want to mention that the first thing I saw when I woke up this morning was a text from her and it was the one that she sent to you and me. And but I just saw, you know, her text and there it is. And uh, I uh, I didn't see the preview of it. And so my first thought was, oh, no, she's mad at us. <laughs> With, <laughs> For trash and Katie. Katy Perry. <laughs> um, so I was happy to know that it was just a reference to the fly in the ointment book. The fly so, in the ointment, yeah. And I'm happy to know that she laughed at the episode because I don't want to upset your wife. I like I like I like Michael a lot. And I'm, you know. There are, I'll, I'll be honest, there are times where we're recording an episode, I'm like, what is Michael going to think of this that I've just said? And is it <laughs> to result in displeasure? That's like my entire life right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's great. She's big. She's a big fan. Um, you know, I think she wants more representation on the podcast. And I think that, you know, that's a, a valid, a valid, uh, valid concern, which is why I think that a ladies of a, a ladies of uh, of divinity is is due. It is. We just got to get through the growing season for. For JP. Right. Well, and I think, um, and uh, I think too, I mean, my, my wife's funny. Kana's like, who cares what I have to say? That's her attitude whenever I'm like, hey, you should be on an episode. She's like, who cares what I have to say? I'm like, who cares what I have to say? That's right. We're just having fun here. Um, so speaking of not caring about what we have to say, and we are and here. Speaking of, speaking of more hopeful futures for the podcast. Yeah. Um, we are talking about a aesthetic science fiction subgenre. This is maybe one of the weirder episodes. Um, it is known as solar punk. Now, solar punk, like I said, can it's we talk not, about? Well, can we I'm, talk about where where this comes from? Like why? Yeah, we're, no, why yeah, we're that's, about? I was about to say, Patrick. Okay. I want Sorry. you because you're, you're the one who mentioned it to us the other day, and I was really excited because I have I knew about this a while back. Um, but I decided it was one of those weird. I found it through my a weird corner of Tumblr years ago. Um, but you got to watch out for those. Um, and then you brought it up uh, as an aside during one of our episodes a few weeks back. And so I thought this would be great to talk about. So you, please share with our listeners what solar punk is and where it comes from. Well, I first heard about solar punk. Uh, you know, I'm a, it, 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 we're, we're in, you said it was a subgenre of, of science fiction. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm a science fiction fan and have been, you know, by, I think by, by genetics, as long as I've been alive. But I was listening to a, one of my podcasts that I like, which is called Imaginary Worlds, um, where they they go in and talk about specific uh, like properties or you know in, intellectual properties, those kinds of things, and he'll explore kind of the story within there, within those properties. But then he'll also talk more about like how we tell stories and why we tell stories and and that kind of thing. It's, it's a great episode, and he so we had this episode called. Oh, I looked it up, um, and of course I'm not going to be able to find it. But it's called like "Solar Punk is the Future" or something was the name of the episode. And I said, "This this sounds interesting." So I listened to it, and I had no I had no idea what Solar Punk was. I didn't recognize the name, um, and and so I listened to it and was pleased to learn about Solar Punk, which is um, it comes comes off of um, it's a spinoff of the idea of cyberpunk, which is the first. Um, I think iteration, named iteration anyway, of these subgenres of, of science fiction, um, wherein so sub so cyberpunk is this idea that as 
technology moves forward, human beings are trash and will use technology in a way that kind of destroys society or destroys the world, that the combination of kind of artificial intelligence and, and cybernetics are going to cause a breakdown in the social order. I think that the, I don't, I don't know exactly when the, what the genesis is, but the big kind of prototypical novel of this is, um, is Neuromancer by, um, by William Gibson, which is 18, 1984. Um, and so if you think about, so cyberpunk, let's, let's talk about some cyberpunk things. Um, what, what's the, what's the big movie that I can't think of? The Matrix? Well, cer cer certainly The Matrix, but I'm thinking of it, the movie that do androids dream of Blade Runner. Oh, Blade, Blade Runner. Runner is cyberpunk, right? That's, Which that's the kind I of I have idea. never seen. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I have not seen the new one, which is scandalous, I, I've, I've heard, for people who like the original one. But um, it, So it's the idea that basically as, as technology progresses, human beings are going to use it in a way that ends up creating kind of a dystopian, dystopian future, right? Then there's all these different kind of derivatives of cyberpunk that have come out over time. Um, that the kind of the, probably the most uh, common of which, or the most known of which, is steampunk, which is the idea that um, it's, it's more of like a fantasy into the future. The idea that kind of like steam era, a steam steam based area, you know, industrial revolution technology, and that and the aesthetic of that will carry a forward into the future, and imagining what a future might look like where we're still using. Kind of steam power and so are instead of robots that are built on you know s s silicon chips or whatever they're robots that run on steam or those kinds of um, industrial era power um, and there's a certain kind of aesthetic to it that, that's that's very popular and so there's whole you know con conventions about st steampunk that kind of thing yeah it's a speculative fiction thing and uh, what i my favorite my favorite one sentence uh summary of steampunk came from um, our friend from seminary who said steampunk is goths who discovered the color brown <laughs> <laughs> i i'm trying to think about some some examples of steampunk that people may be more familiar with but I, I, nobody wow, saw wow. it at the, the wow wow west is a great example that people have seen the, there was a movie that just came out um in 2018 called mortal engines that got 28 26 percent on rotten tomatoes um well there's that um that mortal mortal engines that one is kind of steampunk as well well there's also what bioshock peter Bio jackson uh, bioshock and their video games yeah 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 so there's there's some definitely popular popular versions of it so i've heard of both cyberpunk and solar punk um and so i knew because it, or sorry cyberpunk and steampunk i knew that because it was this thing was called solar punk that it was going to be something like that but i had no idea what it was and started listening to this episode and and learned that it is um, the same kind of a thing, speculative fiction, sub subgenre of science fiction, but it's 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 fiction that looks forward and sees a hopeful future. That instead of seeing a dystopian future or a future that is um, somehow um, less than or different because of a specific technology, it is it is a it is a, about speculative future visions that are um, rooted in hope and, um, and 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 kind of the amazing and wonderful things we're going to be able to do in the future and so this episode was was fascinating uh, it was it focused specifically on like one zine or something that does short stories based in solar punk um, but anyway, I shared it because I'd never heard of it before. I shared it with the Masters of Divinity and was really um, interested in it. And it turns out that you already had some uh, some knowledge of solar punk, and and so here we are. So yeah, so I found out us. about it. Well, I found out about it uh, uh, roughly around the time that um, that uh, Black Panther came out, mm -hmm. um, because I had I can't remember where exactly, like how exactly I found it. Again, it was like one of these click hole things where I was uh, I, I I saw the phrase Afrofuturism used to refer to um, Wakanda. And, and it was described as this, another kind of speculative fiction, similar to, similar to, to steampunk in the sense of, you know, what, how would society progress if something was a little bit different in the past, right? So um, Afrofuturism is this idea that tries, to, that tries to imagine what the world would be like if Africa had been the major driving force in global development rather than Western Europe. Just such a fascinating idea. And so they use those hallmarks, particularly the fiction of someone named Octavia Butler, 
um, as the basis for how they can imagine what Wakanda would look like um, in, in that. And so reading about it, I, I saw just somebody mentioned the phrase solar punk. Like it might've been one of those, like it was like tagged in the article, right? Like, you know, subjects. And so being that like, I'm aware of cyberpunk and steampunk, um, I was sort of curious about, oh, what is, well, what is solar punk? And that's when I, I, I came across a few things on Tumblr, a few posts. I mean, at the time, it was just mostly images that I saw, like pictures and, and, and ideas there around that. Um, there is like a 2014 document that's a sort of manifesto of, of um, solar punk that I read a little bit um, this morning before we came on. Mm -hmm. um, but what I what I like about it is, yeah, it's that hopeful piece. Right. It's so it's like it's like it's like cyberpunk in the sense that it's about the it's about technological development, but it's about the ways in which technology can be liberating rather than oppressive. And it's punk in the sense that it's using those things as a way to challenge authority and powers that be and emphasizing that the, the sort of sort of communitarian anarchy type thing that can come from knowing how to do things yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a good thing to talk about, not only because here we are in a world where it feels fairly dystopian, um, but you know, it, one of the things that was really curious to me that happened during the early days of the pandemic is that um, people decided they wanted to make bread while they were in quarantine. And so people were making all this bread and there was, it turned out there was this run on yeast. Nobody could buy yeast and people were freaking out. They could not find baker's yeast. Right. And this tweet from a, um, from a microbiologist, I can't remember where he was, Princeton or something like that. He had heard that there was this whole like run on yeast and that nobody could find yeast. And he just goes, hold on, wait. Like he, he tweeted, he said, there's no shortage of yeast. It's like basically like mix your flour, mix your water and set it in the corner for 45 minutes and shock, <laughs> you'll have yeast. Right. And I, I mentioned that because, right, we live in this we live in this current world where we've become like to me, this thing revealed just how consumerized we have become that we think of everything in terms of what we need to buy in order to accomplish things. Mm -hmm. The idea that we could actually do things that are free and they are freely available to us all the time is a liberating, it's a liberating idea. And mm -hmm. so the idea then that you have a future that sort of brings this up or can help push this forward. This is the thing about solar punk that, in, that intrigues me because, um, it, it kind of coincides with something I had read about years ago saying that we had entered into something called the, um, we've moved out of the information age and we are now in the infrastructure age. And that we are looking at a very real possibility where people can be self-sufficient in terms of like energy usage and needs. Because you, know, you can effectively put like a wind turbine and solar panels on your house and derive your own power without having to pay a government subsidized conglomerate in order for the right to be able to use electricity. Um, and that that's one of the reasons why like power companies are very threatened by the development of solar because they know that it starts to take away that, 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 that power and that stranglehold that people have. And so, you know, like when I bought, when I bought my electric car last year and sort of saw the possibility of this, I was just thinking like, what a what a crazy idea that we have th this possibility exists and what solar punk is trying to do is create an aesthetic and literary outlet and everything in order to get people to sort of start thinking about the possibility here and that you know technology doesn't have to be a death sentence it can actually be you know these are tools that can make people more free and so i think that that's a that's a cool way to talk about this and it 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 you know stems out of stuff that we've seen during this 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 sort of dystopic time that we're in. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, and it, it the, the, the podcast episode that I listened to about it when I was learning about it was really highlighting it because it is a place where, um, you know, the, 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 the history of science fiction is a history of white men, right? It is, uh -huh. it has been very largely and highly curated by 
um, by, by white men. There, there are some standouts, um, Octavia Butler, you, you mentioned, and Anne McCaffrey, and um, C.J. Sherry, and like there's, there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, women and people of color who have excelled, um, but it is, but, but plenty, but not near representative sample, right? But that solar punk is a place where um, diverse voices are finding a, a niche. Um, and so when, when you talk about like that, that idea of technology being not a thing that enslaves us, all uh, like TV shows like the Black, like Black Mirror, technology being this thing that can free us and that can be an equalizer and an, uh, and an uplifter of the, of the lowly um, and the, those who are marginalized, um, it just sounded like a fascinating idea, which is exactly like you talked about Afrofuturism and and uh, uh, yeah, Black Panther being one of the most popular examples of that. But Afrofuturism, the idea of Afrofuturism goes back way before then. I mean, like you look at like, yeah. George Clinton and and and, P, and P Funk All Stars, like it, it goes into music. It's in it's in all these different places um, where it is. What if this was? What if this was our thing, right? What if we claim this as this isn't this heritage of the of the oppressors of the of, of oppression, but it is. It can be anybody's heritage. Anybody can look into the future and imagine. And if we were, um, if we are among a marginalized group and we look to the future and see equality and power, what does that look like? And it ends up being a. It can end up being a hopeful vision um, for, for for the future. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible, an incredible message, and it just like, I, we'll, we'll get there eventually, I'm sure. But <laughs> I hear it, and I'm just like, man, like this is what the gospel is, man. Like, oh yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's 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 like this is exactly what Jesus is trying to do, you know, like give to the marginalized a, a, a vision of the future that is completely different than what they they currently see and and, and live. Right, and rooted in harmony. Right, I mean. Right. It's, it's, I think of, um, well, so as we're talking about this, I'm thinking a little bit about Steve Jobs, um, you know, who, who was a jerk, um, but brilliant. And one of the things that set Jobs apart from everybody else during the, during the early days of personal computing was that Jobs was not an engineer. Um, you know, he was friends with Wozniak and Gates and all these people who were engineers but, but Jobs was able to look at what his friends were doing in the world of computing, and he saw potential in it to be something countercultural. And if you've ever read his, have you read his biography, the no. Walter Isaacson biography? It's fascinating because at the time, hippies associated computers with IBM and the military industrial complex. And so one of the things that Steve Jobs wanted is he wanted to put computers like the how to build kits and all that kind of stuff um, in the whole earth catalog, which is you know this famous hippie catalog. And they were like initially, no, why would we do that? Like these are military, this is military stuff. Why would we wanna put that in there? And he had to work really hard to get them to understand that no, like this actually allows for, you know, these are tools. If you think about it as a tool for self-determination and for liber you know, liberation and all of that, then that's, then that's, that's key. And that's what got the hippies involved in, in computing and what computers could be. And I mean, arguably that's what Silicon Valley is rooted in, which ironically Silicon Valley, you know, looks more like Black Mirror than it does right, exactly. solar punk. Um, but getting back to that initial idea of somebody who saw in this a different approach and a different way of using it, um, that it could be, you know, again, seeing it as a tool rather than the end goal of it in and of itself, which is where, you know, people like Bill Gates, I mean, Bill Gates is a hobbyist, right? So he, he focused on building computers as like a, as the way a hobbyist does. It's not about, um, you know, making sure that it works so you can accomplish something else over here. Like you're involved in this because it's like ham radio. You're just building this stuff in order to, you know, right to build it. Um, and, and we sadly don't see too many people like that today that are developing technology with that kind of mindset. Well, uh, what we also see, I mean, I'll like push back a little bit about that. Like you also, you also see those same people then create these mega multinational mega corps right. that, and, and then that the initial, the initial love for, um, gets, I mean, I like, I, 
Bill Gates, I'm sure, is doing great things with his life and everything, but the you know absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? And that's that, that's why I have like the thing that's so nice about about Solar Punk is that it is so like other than it being what I think more like a Christian message, it is so different <laughs> than how I've been trained to think about the future and about what yeah. science about science fiction because it's not what I see, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Well, no, but I, and I'm, but I agree with you that I think I think like people I think people like Gates and everybody else got stuff wrong, right? In this, because what hap what has happened is that they've they've effectively became they they went from being sort of community type people to being capitalists, and so now they became the ones who dispensed the tools and the knowledge to you, and so now you became dependent on them. Right. Um, well, I and, remember, and the and the misanthrop the mis misanthropism of um, of nerds as well, right? Like we see people yeah. like, the, I mean, the whole story of of, uh, of, of of Facebook is is one that is like rooted in, like I don't really like people, but I can like exploit them, yeah, uh, and and make significant amounts of money about it. Yeah, well, and and like, you know, because it's 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 a really amazing thing when you realize. Okay, so like YouTube, YouTube is a great is a great thing because YouTube gives us access to videos of people who are sharing knowledge and information so that you can use it to do different things, right? Like Kane and I watched a documentary years back on tiny houses because we thought about building a tiny house. And we were amazed to watch that this young couple did everything just through watching YouTube videos. Mm. Like this guy did, he watched a YouTube video on how to wire a house. And so that's what he did. Um, you know, so, so the fact that like this stuff is out there, you can access it, it's free, it's applying it and now you, you know, some of it is, so it's just kind of a fascinating thing that, and raises this interesting question of what's holding us back in this, I guess the government, but I don't know. But I don't know, I, I'm, this is, like I said, that so much of this stuff is freely available to all of us. It's already out there. I mean, that's kind of what I feel like getting back to the idea of this as a vision of yeah. the future, similar to the gospel is that message of Jesus saying, you know, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is within you, right? It's not, you know, to take Paul's idea, it's not, you know, somewhere far away that you can go get it. And it's not somewhere deep where you have to go bring it up. Like it's here, right? It's written on your hearts. It's right in your midst. Right. And so Jesus partly seems to be trying to get people on board with that idea of like, it. it's here and now if you want it um, right. and live like it's here and now. Um, and, and so that, that is a hopeful idea and message. I'm, and it seems like it should just kind of go without saying, but are we so accustomed to having someone else do it for us that we just don't want to take the responsibility for ourselves to, or, I mean, that, that's not Maybe. even right. I mean, that's the salvation happened yeah. because of Jesus, but uh, anyway, I don't know. It, well, uh, um, a bit back to your original, you know, point about yeast, right? Like the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, right? Yeah. And and the way that I usually preach that sermon is like you get it into the bread and then it gets everywhere, right? But but there's a more powerful version of that sermon, which is what you had what you just said, which is the kingdom of God is like yeast, meaning that it's all around you. It's not something that you go to the, buy on the shelf. You leave out the right conditions for it. You create the right conditions around you. And it manifests itself. If you want sourdough, yeah. let your bread go sour. <laughs> like right. it, that's that, that's how you make it. You know, it doesn't have to be some artisanal yeast blend that came from somewhere else. You know, um, yeah. I just finished I just finished reading a book um, called Entangled Life. Um, I, I, I even included it in a sermon a couple weeks ago, but it's called Entangled Life: How Fungi Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures by this guy named Merlin Sheldrake. Merlin Sheldrake. I I gotta I, I gotta shout this name from the rooftops wherever I can. It's an incredible name. He's a mycologist, English uh, mycologist. Course, when you have a name like that, you are that's predisposed. Merlin Sheldrake. I just can't even like, I can't even get out of, anyway, Michael's going to be listening to this episode and she's going to say, God, he's talking about Merlin Sheldrake again. Um, the final, the final um, chapter of the book, it's, it's an incredible book and I would very highly recommend it. But the fi final chapter of the book, he kind of talks about like, what is the future of fungi and like, how are people using uh, fungi? And it made me think about solar punk the whole time because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, um, 
One of my favorite books of the last few years that I've read is a trilogy by N.K. Jemisin um, called The Broken Earth Trilogy. And it's kind of about a far, far future that is kind of like it went through solar punk into kind of cyberpunk, basically. And as you read through the books, you learn about the solar punk time period. And what it was was it was it was. It was a world that was built around like organic structures, right? And working working with the world, with plant life, with fungal life to create uh, buildings, to build, you know, to 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 build materials out of plant life that were just as strong as as as, as concrete, you know. And that that the, what what happened in the fall of that isn't doesn't matter as much. But he was talking about that he, in in his book. He's like, you know, there are people out there right now who are doing these things, who are figuring out, who are answering these questions that we have about climate change and and global warming and our um, misuse of creation, our uh, rampant, rapacious use of creation, and they're doing it through these organisms and these things that have been around us all the time, all along, right? And and have preceded, have, have preceded us and will postcede us. And unless we can kind of tap into that and imagine for ourselves a different way of doing things, we're not going to ever change. We're just going to, like you like you were talking about, we're just going to eat ourselves into a, into oblivion um, by relying on someone else to do it for us. Yeah, sorry, I just got a text from Kana. Every time I get them, te- Kana like never texts. Now she's texting all the time, but it's about nothing related to the baby. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but no, you're talking about like talking about fungi. I'm glad you brought that up because I actually wanted to bring up fungi in this because hey, hey, the idea that like because like you know I'm thinking about like oh like you know using it to like grow buildings right right that's being talked about so so mycelium um, you know is this you know material that apparently links the cosmos and we can warp through it using our starships but it's also um like getting super high yeah but yeah. this is uh but no this um mycelium is a is a type of fungus that or type of fungi whatever that um grows like just in like you know decaying organic matter like most fungi do this uh one guy discovered one day he picked up a log while he was out hiking and he realized that this log was actually broken piece to two pieces of wood sort of held together and he said he was amazed at how this second piece of wood was stuck to this first piece of wood and he was like what is doing this and so he he was a biologist and he scraped some and he brought him with it and he found it was this 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 fungus and so he started thinking about how can i use it like how can we use this in sort of a commercial application like how can we use this for for you know practical stuff and so um, they created, um, it's called Myco something, I can't remember the company, but they basically use it as an alternative to styrofoam. Right. Uh, and you can buy molds like and wood chips and you just put your wood chips in the mold and you put the matrix in there and it grows. Mm-hmm. And then you bake it once you get it to the place you want it to be. And it's basically like extruded polystyrene foam. And people have made surfboards out of this stuff, mm-hmm. which is fascinating to me. And, you know, and as, as a surfer, one of the cool things about, about the surfing world is that no one in the surfing world, very few people in the surfing world treat knowledge as privileged information. Mm. It's one of these things that people will share it, but you've just got to learn how to do it, right? Like it, you know, the, anyone can make a surfboard. Surfboards are actually not that difficult. The, 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 entry, the entry cost of a surfboard is materials. That's it. Right. Right. You can find videos that teach you everything you need to know. I've made three surfboards. It's a very, you know, it's a great thing. And going on to the message board sway locks, which is like the place where like some of the most like the pros who are making boards for, you know, like these legendary shapers, they're posting stuff on there and giving their information out for free for Mm -hmm. anyone who wants it. So you've already got like something like that, a network of people who freely share information and techniques. But then you also got the means of saying like you could grow the foam. You don't have to have a factory and the chemicals and all of it necessarily to blow the foam. You could just grow it right. and make it. I mean, that opens up a whole realm of possibilities of materials making. Like, you know, this company also makes stools. You can grow a stool. They're talking about trying to build houses where they basically build the mold, grow the thing in the mold, and then remove the mold. And you've right. got a house made out of fungus that's as strong as concrete. Right. Um, I mean, and they amazing. make and they make they make leather out of the stuff and like yeah. they, they do all kinds of yeah it's in, it's incredible, um, yeah and like that's the that's the thing like 
everybody's got to read this book seriously it, it it's it, so mycelial networks are the things that connect all all of the fungus together right but then the thing that we we don't realize and we don't know is that fungus are in charge of like everything that happens in our world like plants can't grow without mycelial networks to help them like with their roots like like there's there's one biologist who talks about how like how plants don't actually have roots they have fungus and the fungus is what feeds the feed, feeds the plant. It's just it's, it's it's fascinating stuff. And it's again, it's all around us, and we just have right. to, you know. And so I, I like what you're saying about the dem, the democratization of um, of information and the spread of the spread the kind of free flow of information being one of these things that can lead to a hopeful vision instead of the instead of the key key holders who um, uh, have to provide you, you have to get their permission for them to provide access you can find it on youtube you know right. which is also controlled by a megacorp but well yeah um <laughs> but subversion you right you, know, you can be right. you can you know subversion i um well go, when i before we recorded i was um I, I took a real quick glance over at the wikipedia entry on solar punk just to kind of get mm -hmm. like you know big broad strokes thing and I, I and i read a couple of other things but um one thing that it linked in there that i thought was interesting a phrase i'd never heard before which is um, prefigurative politics and says that solar punk is rooted or based on prefigurative politics. And so I had to look that up. And so what prefigurative um, politics is, is that you're basically saying, here's the goal that we want. And so we're going to live as though we're going to live now as though that goal is a reality. And I saw that and I said, oh, that's tele that's teleology. Like that's right. a that's the theological concept. I mean, that's that's eschatology. That's all the stuff that we Christians have believed in from the beginning. And so I think you're onto something when we talk about this, Patrick, that that this is a moment in time where maybe like the as Christians, you know, it's important for us to kind of, you know, we need we're in a disruptive moment where we're breaking some continuity a little bit because of, you know, we've seen the heritage of white supremacy and all this kind of stuff impacting the church. So we're at a right. we're in a point of, you know, we've already come through a time of breaking heteronormativity and all that and all that kind of thing. And so because in the Episcopal Church we're in that place, we also are now kind of freed to really live into that teleology that is a hopeful idea. It doesn't just have to be rooted in technology, but in mm -hmm. how we move forward and what drives us, what are the engines that drive us. And so, you know, so really like I mean it's an exciting thing for for evangelism. Yeah. Um to be able to talk about the world we live in now and that the vision is there it's it's actually ancient wisdom none of it right. is this isn't a new idea it's just an old, an old idea we have done a really bad job of living into yeah i heard i heard about the that idea of what did you call it prescriptive politics um uh, um 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 um, per, um prefigurative prefigurative politics so i was listening to um another another podcast this is my life um, this day, and I learned about a, a, a thing that had happened in 1968 that I wasn't that I was that I didn't know about. It's called this this day in esoteric political history. Um, we just passed the anniversary of um, of something called Resurrection City, that okay. was uh, it was like a tent a tent community basically that had sprung up on the mall um, and it was run by the Poor People's Campaign um, after King's assassination, after MLK's assassination, and it was exactly this. It was it was. It was people saying we need to have a different way of seeing the world, and we're going to model what that can can look like, right? Then so the, what they did was they got together and they said we're going to be a community, right? And this is where you this is, it's interesting. I'm I'm saying this and I'm also thinking about like Occupy, and thinking about like these kind of live in these kind of live in models of what the future could be trying to bear witness, right? And then they get crushed, right? By both um, internal strife and their and the, and the uh, effects of outward influence on them. You know, in the case of the Resurrection City, it was the police coming in and breaking it up, right? In the case of Occupy, it was the police and some, some of their own internal workings as well. Um, I don't know what I'm, I'm saying. I'm just saying like that, that that's true. Like that's that's one of the state, that's one of my, you know, they say you only give like three sermons. <laughs> like one of my sermons yeah. is like, the thing I worry about is that we don't do a good job with formation, where right. we give people the practices and the tools to actually to actually live out what we say we believe. 
you know? And so saying, so using it as, I'm, I'm worried about using it as an evangelical tool when it's very difficult for me to point to any single person, let alone a community of people that is doing it, you know, that's really like living the kingdom within the, their kingdom of control. And it's just, well, it's just hard, it's hard to, it's hard to do it when it's a, when it feels like it's more of an idea. Well, that actually leads into the next thing about this topic that I think is worth discussing is, you know, is real world examples. Um, and part of what got me, you know, I, I just suggested this topic actually yesterday in a, in a message to you. And I, I got that part of what inspired me to think about it is I was driving home from work. So I work in downtown Honolulu and I live out in a neighborhood called Hawaii Kai. So it's a 30 minute drive um, on the H1. And I go through numerous valleys and I have mountain ranges on one side. I have um, Leahi, also known as Diamond Head, on the other side. Um, and I can see the city. Um, and I realized, so Kane and I, when we first came, we, we, we commented how much Honolulu looks, looks like an Asian city. It doesn't look like any other city we've ever seen in the United States. I told her there are elements of it that kind of remind me of Bangkok. She says it reminds me, it reminded her a lot of Singapore. Well, both of those cities are cited as examples for the for the solar punk aesthetic because they are both large cities that utilize a lot of greenery um, and uh, you know alternative technologies and things like that in the cityscape and so i started to wonder about honolulu and you know it's kind of fascinating because we've got a couple of things at play here one um, one of the things that i notice here that i that i've not seen anywhere else is just the abundance of electric cars there are a lot of electric cars here. Part of that is due to the fact that Hawaii has set up all kinds of incentives for having them. You know, you can park for free in a lot of places, um, like parking garages and things like that, if you have an electric car. So a lot of people have gravitated to buying them, so the incentive worked. Um, right. So many houses and buildings have solar panels on top of them. Um, you know, when you're on the North Shore, there is a massive wind turbine farm that's really quite beautiful up in the mountains. Um, so that's one thing, right? The technology piece is kind of there in terms of using alternative energy drawing. There's plant life all over the place in the city. There's there's only like one or two real areas that I would think of as, as classic concrete jungle. Everywhere else there's some kind of tree or something dominating the landscape. And that's and that speaks to the other part, which is how much of this is still rooted in a Hawaiian mindset that tries to find a balance with nature as well as with what humans have to do. Um, it's interesting, Kane and I joke that when we go into the areas that look more like suburban sprawl, um, white people dominate the landscape. Mm -hmm. But when you get into the areas where you see more of a blending, it's a much more mixed ethnic, ethnic community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the other piece about solar punk we have not talked too much about is that it's it's not only about the technology and how it makes us free, but it's also about how it blurs those lines and brings us together as different people groups. You know, so like I'm living in a place where it's very weird in that, um, I, you know, I come from I come from Florida, which is not really the South, um, but I have family who live in Georgia, which is the South. And so that's been a big part of my rooting and identity to then come here where there is no ethnic majority. Um, and so as a result, all of that kind of crap plays out very differently than it does anywhere else on the mainland. And there seems to be a bit more of a, you know, not to say there's obviously there's still problems, but there's a bit more of a harmonious thing to it. And people are a little bit more relaxed and chill with each other because they've sort of learned to focus that in the midst of all this diversity, there's this thing that binds everything together. And they try to, they try to find that. And of course, that's, that's summarized in the term aloha. Um, which itself is rooted in the way that the way that um, the Oiwi Hawaiians, the original Hawaiians, um, saw their life and existence here, because you know they they were very acutely aware of the fact that these islands resulted from volcanoes, and that the volcano the lava cooled in the water, and then the ohia trees were the first things to grow in the lava. And so they know that the ohia tree, which they revere really seriously, particularly on the big island, 
um, is responsible for everything that's here. Without the ohia tree, nothing else is here. And so those relationships and that, those res and that respect that comes with the plants and the trees that are responsible for bringing all the animals, which then in turn brought people, um, is, is all part of this mindset of this interconnectivity that lives here. And so people try to find this medium in between it all to, to coexist. And that allows for this to be a place of a lot of blended culture where it's not like a tokenized blended culture or like a consumer's blended culture, but it feels like a very authentic thing. Like, oh, the thing that you like is cool. Well, we think this is cool. So we're going to adopt it into here. You adopt the thing here. And it just sort of, again, finds this, this, this happy medium. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if like a place like this is a vision of what things could be. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. said that about Honolulu when he came once, that he saw that there was a vision of a future that he hoped for for the rest of the world here in Hawaii. Um, it's also curious that when you look at human migration, Hawaii is one of the last places that humans settled. So this is technically the new world in the grand scheme of things because this was the last. And so here we are in a place where it in some ways could be like what we're hoping for for other parts of the world. And when we have our problems here, they seem to be the problems that are exported from the mainland or other places rather than things that are like part of living here, right? It's it's external forces impacting it rather than internal. I mean, I've only been here a few months, so I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not an expert on this, but just just thinking about it in terms of these bigger questions, this bigger vision, you know, is there something to... You know, do we have something really special here that could be an example for the wider world? Um, <laughs> okay, can I pause you right there? Because yeah, so like you're, I think you're. It's interesting, you know, like much love to Hawaii, but you said like an example for the wider world, and 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 I, what I first heard you say because I was thinking along these lines was, is it an example for the wider world? Oh, oh, right. And I started to think about, you know, one of the things that are, that are mutual friend Jabril talks about is how like the, the, the history of the history of white people <laughs> is the history of exploitation and, you know, and profit motives that drive the kind of policies that end up creating systems of, of racist ideology and white supremacy, et cetera. And as you were talking about um, Hawaiian culture and specifically native Hawaiian culture, I was also thinking about some of the same things that could be said about the kind of pre white man times in yeah. my own, in my own area, right. Where Buffalo Rome and where, you know, like that there's this, there's this, um, you know, I don't want to like fetishize or kind of uplift the, the, the like this, the, the noble native, the notable right. noble savage. I don't want to be guilty of that in any way, but I think that that's, that's kind of where we're kind of seeing is that there's this, there's this thing that has happened in Western culture um, I was going to say post enlightenment, but it's even pre enlightenment, where exploitation and and over and overness, you know, and and feudal systems are the thing that drives that drives the world, and that there's something to that relationship with the land that is uh, that that is necessary for us to 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 learn by and, and in order to do that we have to let go of the power and control that we have um, um, claimed. For ourselves or that our forebears have claimed for us yeah and i think yeah because there is that tendency right yeah you said of the noble savage thing and the fetishizing of native and indigenous communities on the part of of white people um but i think i think that part of it is that these these are these are civilizations that have maintained a mentality and mindset that goes back to very ancient to very ancient ways of being human that we lost along the way in places like Western Europe, that we abandoned stuff that we've kind of always known to be true. And I think it's no coincidence that Jesus is pretty pointedly challenging Roman imperial identity, which itself is this aberration in what it means to be human. And probably one of the most ultimate examples of that aberration. Um, I mean, just, this has just popped in my head. Think about like, here's, this is the, the, here's, a, here's a fun sermon or fun exegesis. 
Rome, the Roman Empire as the Tower of Babel, right? Because Babel was where everybody was together, and the story of Babel is that God gave them different languages so that they would disperse. Mm -hmm. But Rome started incorporating all these people from all over the world and languages and identities and tried to put them all alongside each other. And so Rome effectively becomes like the undoing or the reversal of Babel, but it's, but it's still Babel. Like it's not... So it's not really undoing of Babel. It's just sort of Babel 2.0. Uh, so, but but I would say like you, you're sort of, but it's but it's exactly what American culture tries to do. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah, that yeah. Idea of melting of melting pot, right? It's it's kind of the like you say reverse Babel. It's saying it's saying take all of these cultures and everything, but then when you're here, you're unless, except for you Jews because we don't quite understand you. Everybody else like. This is the cult, right? This is the worship. This is the language. This is what we do. You have to kind of fit within one very limited scope I, a definition of what it means to be a Roman citizen, what it means to be an American citizen. And if you look this way, then you have to step up and you have to step up and do it in this way. If you speak this language, you need to get rid of that and speak this language. You have to homo homogenize and do the melting pot. Right. What you're speaking of when you speak about Hawaii is it's still possible to have that. Um, the it's still it's still possible to have kind of the the heights of technology and culture, but maintaining a diversity that's much more of like kind of like the salad bowl, right? Where individual culture is um, is is honored and allowed to maintain itself, and then what comes out of that is in the, is, as an amalgamation is from the authentically real instead of the imposed limitation. Right. Yeah. It's come. I don't know. If this is a fitting metaphor, but it's almost like in America, what we try to do is it's like we try to take a salad and throw it in the blender. Right. Where that sort of that sort of ruins the salad, even though all the ingredients are there, somehow it's been ruined. Whereas if you eat the salad, the complexity and everything of the salad is what makes the salad special. Right. And you know, Hawaii Hawaii puts this stuff on. I mean, it's front and center. I mean, like. <laughs> You know, people who are uncomfortable with racial and ethnic conversations would be shocked at like the way the, the cavalier attitudes that people have here. But it's done out of a place of sort of like love and familiarity. It's not out of like an othering. Right. right. So like people will describe each other by their race all the time. And it's not seen as it's not seen as like a weird thing. Um, the um, um, the other but that, but I think part of that is due to this Hawaiian concept that's common throughout Polynesian society that in Hawaiian, the word is hanai, which is a word for adoption. But it's an adoption that's like, it's really hard to explain because it's like you can basically be a part of, it's like you can be part of my, I, like you could be effectively Hawaiian without, but, but, you, but you still don't have Hawaiian blood. So like there's this distinction, but it's, you're still part of, the thing and that kind of feeds into the whole concept of ohana which is this right. like you have family even though you're you know cousin you know everyone's cousin this or auntie or uncle that here um because of those kinds of relations even though you're not blood related and nobody wants you to be blood related they want those distinctions to still exist because those are important even though we find happy equilibrium between them mm -hmm. um and i mean to me like that that's a little bit of almost like a foretaste of the kingdom of god right that we we see this vision of the world where difference is not diminished and it's not destroyed, right? Like when Jesus says, you know, that there is no longer male or female, right? You know, Jew or Gentile, um, slave or free or any of that, you know, he's not, he's not mashing us all into like gray Some goo. mannequin, right? <laughs> right exactly. Yeah. Some it's, sexless whatever thing, yeah. Yeah, it's just that all the like all the like definitive markers that we've built up on those labels go away. Yeah. And and that, you know, we get to live fully into all of those roles and those identities that like in the kingdom of God, you know, we're all the best version of of what we are. Um, mm -hmm. freed from all the baggage and sin that that hold us back. I just want to say I realized that. The examples that are often held up as a solar punk example in aesthetics are always kind of tropical. Mm. I'm curious about what does solar punk look like in like a plain society? Planes, not like yeah. Planes. I mean, right. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I have. Uh, I don't know if I have an example of what of of, of real life solar punk that I've seen. Um, you know, and I think you're talking about like an aesthetic. 
the the, the aesthetic question, which I think is interesting, and when, and when I've ever seen anything depicted, it's about it is more of those kind of like tropical locales, you know, places where you can ex exist, you know, closer to nature or whatever else. Um, the thing that I keep thinking about is like, what's the policy level distinction that's 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 necessary? You know, yeah. like how do you how do you how do you get there? And I don't know I don't know if I haven't answered the question, but so my answer to your question is I do not see solar punk as much in a real world uh, in a real world context. I can obviously, as we've talked about, see it in a as in a theological framework. Um, I'm compelled by what you say about Hawaii, having never been there, but. Um, the thing that I was thinking about was, you know, to take it back to one of our our favorite uh, um, hammers to beat on, is um, is is Star Trek solar punk? I was actually thinking that. Um, there was a there was actually a blog on Medium.com that was like Star Trek and solar punk, and I tried to read it, but it is like private. I couldn't read it anymore. Hmm. Um, it's not re not readable. Um, I'm maybe I would think I think Discovery I think Star Trek Discovery presents somewhat of a more solar punk esque Star Trek because mostly because of the spore drive. Um, it's because it's hard to say that it's hard to say that conventional Star Trek as we've known it prior to Discovery would be um, solar punk because it involves dilithium, which involves mining, which involves violence to to a natural thing right well so and that's so but i but i wonder though is it possible to have solar punk without i mean like any kind of mining and ore i don't think you're, you're i don't think for me the idea of solar punk is about a kind of harmonized and hopeful future looking forward and it's less about kind of how you how you get there because you would assume that the like like i don't think everybody needs to be vegan like it's not about nonviolence necessarily and so if there's a if there's some kind of like sustainable way to farm or grow dilithium then it's possible to still you know that that doesn't have to be a factor as much but what star trek tries to do is it tries to present a hopeful a hopeful future and largely succeeds but this but the but the shows of star trek are all about kind of how human nature as is classified both by the humans usually high ranking humans or as as displayed in stereotypical ways by alien races, how that that try, tries to kind of like break into the world of solar punk, into the hopeful vision of this idealized mm -hmm. future, and then the and then how solar punk or how the how the Federation tries to react to that, you know, or or has to deal with that, um, which makes me think that it probably is solar punk, but it's solar punk that exists in a in a in a world that. Uh, understands that in, in a diversity of in the diversity of a space of space you're gonna come up against cultures that are not trying to be the hope you know right right um so the big question it sounds like is how does this translate from just being a bunch of really cool ideas and platitudes right to being something that's actually in practice. And I think that's 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 the that's the challenge that Christianity has been dealing with for over 2000 years. Um I'm 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 I'll just putting my cards on the table about all of this. I think that you have to have a grounding myth and narrative in order for anything to really be effective. Um right. I don't think that you can you know, you, you can't be too slapdash, right? You've got to have something that's a common, a common whatever. And I'm, of course, I, you know, showing my bias. I'm, I'm, I think it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is that grounding and common thing. I mean, I just think about Eucharistic practice. I mean, Eucharist, Eucharistic practice seems to be like one of the most like solar punk kind of things that you can do. It's full harmony with all of creation, unifying all people together and elevating them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then and seeing us being transformed and then and then empowered to go out into the world, bringing that sort of mindset and everything with us. Um, and so I think that 
And I think some just somewhere along the way, I, I, maybe maybe it was Constantine. I don't know, but we just seem to get confused and think that what we do in the church is kind of something that we just do on our own little insular basis that we do to pass the time. Mm-hmm. And well, that- NT Wright, NT Wright would talk about how the what you're talking about is the, the kind of like personalization of religious practice um is a is a modern thing is a is a post enlightenment thing that yeah. as that the that as the world a world that is kind of structured around everybody understanding the church to be the central organizing principle um even a problematic form of it but um that once that goes away and people start to bring in the kind of scientific perspective, that religion becomes more personal, personal practice. And then that gets reinforced by um, the awakenings, the rise of evangelicalism, the personal relationship with Jesus, the all that stuff. It, it, it ends up reinforcing that, that narrative so that externalized – so that from an outside perspective – the the religion of Jesus Christ, which is a religion of community, is seen as a religion of individuals. Which is a, re- a really kind of a, a, sh- a shocking thing that this is what happened because, you know, Christianity comes out of Judaism, and Judaism, one, is a religion that is so bound to the home rather than a temple. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's bound to the temple during the time, but once the temple's gone right? Like most of your religious identity is found in your home. I mean, the big weekly celebration of what you do is primarily done in your home. Like, you know, the synagogue developed kind of, you know, as we understand it today in conjunction with the mindset of the church, right? We sort of, but like, you know, so the, um, so it's, and I think about something that um, Bishop Neil Alexander, when I was at a thing at um, Sewanee, when he was dean there, um, Sewanee Seminary, he, he told this really interesting story about the Book of Common Prayer, and he said he thinks the Book of Common Prayer is this really amazing, it's probably the great gift that Anglican Christianity gives to the religious landscape. Um, he says, because the amazing thing about the Book of Common Prayer is that Cranmer took, you know, you had your library of books for the priests, you had your library of books for the monks, and then there was a few things of devotional literature or whatever for the common people, but every group of people had their own separate things. And that Cranmer took all of this stuff, he simplified it, he put it in English, he put it in one book, and then he gave it to everyone. And it was like, you know, if you're the king of England or you're the poorest person, we're bound by this same, this same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mentioned that one because that's 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 a cool thing of sort of a democratizing thing in in Christianity that we that we developed. But there's also this the sense that it's rooted in Benedictine spirituality, and that it contained in it is the expectation that one's Christian life would be lived out every day with saying prayers every day, with study and reflection and all of that. And so we always understood this to be something where like, you come on Sunday, but Sunday is Sunday's how you sort of start it off. The real work of Christian of the Christian life and the real life of worship and all that happens, you know, the other days of the week. Sunday is this really small part of it. But what yeah. we wound up doing was we made Sunday all of it. And then when we when we tried to democratize it or whatever it is that was going on, um, the, the end result of it, especially after the Enlightenment, was that it became very personal. And so now I'm living my personal relationship with Jesus in this room with other people and their personal relationship with Jesus. And our relationships might not be the same, but it's okay we're in the room together. Yeah. And there's not this binding principle that we each individually connect with, which is weird from a in all religious in almost all religious understandings, because almost every religion in the world sort of carries this expectation of daily living as a binding principle as a community. We're one of the few that atomized this thing. I wanted to take what you were saying about the Book of Common Prayer and and reflect a little bit on it, which I think is that, like, I think you're right. But I also think that what ends up happening with the Book of Common Prayer is actually more kind of like solar punk and kingdom of God, which is that instead, like, that the Book of Common Prayer put together in this great way that you say that takes all these, this 
you know, thing and puts them together is amazing and wonderful. But it is also then becomes a tool of empire, right? right. And it goes out and inspires and creates this kind of problem, right? And then, and, and, and in each of those places, the empire says, this is how you worship and you have to worship in this specific way in English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then when the, when the empire falls apart and the communion says, okay, like you can do your own thing now, then individual cultures are able to take that yeah. book and to make it their own, to put it into their own language and to put their own um, understanding of prayer into it so that it becomes, so that, like, that's what I love about the Book of Common Prayer, yeah. is that it is this thing that exists in this multitude of ways throughout time and that, well, I, and that I think that some part of its problematic history when it is tied to empire is redeemed by what the people who received it have done with it on their own terms. Yeah, like, okay, so total geek out moment. So something that blew my mind, right? So the so the, the Hawaiian prayer book is the 1662 prayer book, just translated into the Hawaiian language. Kamehameha IV did the translation himself, right. right? So what's amazing to me is looking at, one, his translation of the, of the Lord's Prayer, but also the way he translates the names of the Trinity. Um, is that the the names of the Trinity in Hawaiian? And again, he could be using precedent from the people who translated the Bible. So I don't I don't want to give him too much credit, but I'd love to pretend that like Kamehameha has actually like stumbled into being this theological genius. But he he translate the, the words of the Trinity are Makua, Keiki, and Uhane Holele. Um, Makua is the word for parent. Keiki is the word for child. Now in Hawaiian, some instances when you use Makua without the suffix, it just sort of automatically assumes male, but there's nothing like implicit about that. So, but if you want to, if you want to specify a male gender, you would say makua kane or keiki kane. So basically what, what, what Kamehameha does when he, when, with the translation of the Book of Common Prayer is effectively render the Trinity as parent, child, and Holy Spirit. So it's a gender inclusive thing, which reflects the way the Hawaiian mind sort of sees the family unit. Um, right. it, 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 it's not, it doesn't matter if it's the male parent or the female parent, it's the parent. That's what's important. Um, and so like, so that, so just building off what you're saying, like, here's this thing, a tool of empire, which weirdly enough though, Kamehameha just embraced, like it wasn't imposed on him. Right. Mm -hmm. It was basically like, we like the Anglican church. I mean, in their mind, it's sort of like the people who have gravitated to the Congregationalists and have moved away from liking the Hawaiian royal family might like us more if we have this royal, you know, Christianity, this kind of, you know, imperialistic Christianity as part of our native church. But it's still a brown man taking a white book and interpreting it along Hawaiian lines, which is a really yeah. amazing thing in the history of Anglicanism. Um, but yeah, so I'm with you on this. Like, I just, I love that, like what you're saying, like, here's, what other people have done with it. And it gives insights and also right. gives some insights into what it is we're trying to do now back in the West. And it's like, oh, these people back in the 1800s already figured it out. Right. And maybe that's what, you know, you asked the question about like, how do we, how do we get there? Right. Like maybe that's the lesson is like, if we can see these things, not as threats to our identity, but as a potential way to insight, if we're able to look through the looking glass and to see through the eyes of another and to see ourselves in the eyes of another, right? Like this is the whole, this is the whole message, right? Of like what is going on in our world right now. It's like we as white people, like never, we do, we, we, we have almost <laughs> physically, it is almost physically impossible for us to be able to look at ourselves and to see what we are and what we've wrought and the way that we're perceived, right? But if we can listen and pay attention and give voice to and honor the voices of, um, those who are uh, 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 the, the, the victims of white supremacy, then we can learn something. And if, if that is not a threat, then that, that learning can be painful to us. It will cause us to change our systems. It will cause us to have to dismantle uh, some of the way that we perceive our world to work and the assumptions we make about our world. But that in the end, the result is beauty rather, rather than destruction. Right. Right. And it really kind of gets back to what John the Baptist says. It's time for us to decrease so that 
he may increase, right? It's, it's, and I think we're seeing that. We're seeing that in this reckoning that's taking place that, you know, if we heed what we're seeing, then it is like you said, exactly what we need to do, which is to just kind of shut up and listen for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but also to use the, as white people, to use the privilege and power that we have to defer to the other, to other folks who've not had the same platform that we've had. Um, yeah. um, I mean, I guess the, the, well, I just almost hit my computer. I guess the one caution that's always there is doing it in such a way that it's reaffirming whiteness. So it's like, Right. How do I, a white person, continue Save to have you. this power? Yeah. So I'm going to listen to what you say so that it, I incorporate it into now my white identity and then give it back to you. Right. Um, um, which, by the way, I think is part of what's going on with the Global South issues around sexuality. Hmm. Um, I think it'd be very, I would love to do like a long term study to find out about how, you know, like we gave them this religion. Mm -hmm. And now they've embraced it, but now we're telling them how to do it. <laughs> right, right, exactly. No, it's totally, that. it's all part of that. Um, I think this is an interesting, it's, a, it's been an interesting conversation and I'm interested from our, um, from our listeners, you know, did you like this kind of, you know, this is a kind of a deep dive into a genre kind of a thing. And I wonder if there's, if, the, if this has been interesting, you know, give us, give us a shout out, connect with us on the yeah. Instagrams and the Twitters and uh, tell us what you think. and. And, you know, if we need to do a cyberpunk deep dive, do a, a steampunk deep dive. <laughs> he says grimacing. I don't know. Just thinking about like, um, you know, tell us, tell us what you, what you want us to, to talk about. What are, what, what, what's interesting to you? Uh, yeah. Well, and I think also maybe let's get over the dystopian view of the future. You know, we've had enough Hunger Games. We've had enough of that kind of stuff. Let's let's th let's think about let's think about the future that we want and how we make that happen. And and as if you know, knowing that a fair amount of Christians listen to this podcast, how is the gospel really a something that we're using to apply to that end? Yeah. You know, as, and this has been the thing really that I've been kind of challenging folks all throughout this pandemic is that real question because I think the pandemic raised a bunch of questions for us is in the church. And that really is, is are these platitudes or are these things we actually believe? Right. You know, if we believe that we can't be afraid of death, how does that challenge and change the way in which we address all the stuff that's happening around us? Yeah. Um, and so if there is a future, you know, a future of life abundant, a future that's bright and hopeful and inclusive, a future where people are liberated through the use of technology rather than exploited through the use of technology. Like, how do we do that? And how does that, how do you see your role in that? That would be a good thing to hear from too. That would be good. Okay, I have one final, just like quick, quick response. Is the revelation to St. John, solar punk? Ooh. I think Dude, in the we, long run, it is. I'm sorry, go ahead. Can we, maybe we should just, maybe you and I should just be like, we should, <laughs> uh, I wish, you, wish you had, this is what you should have done with your set, with your sabbatical, man. We could have done like <laughs> the solar punk commentary on the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know enough about, I don't know if I've ever actually legitimately read any solar punk. I just have heard about it and been interested, you know, so I don't know if I would be able to uh, actually do that, but that's what you should do for your sabbatical. So in seven say. years, you should immerse yourself in the worlds of soul in the in the Hawaiian world of solar punk and write the definitive the definitive uh, Hawaiian uh, Bible, the Hawaiian solar punk Bible. <laughs> that sounds like something out of Dune. <laughs> <laughs> Orange Catholic Bible. Um, yeah, I, Dune is not solar punk. No, it is not. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's. What would you call? I mean, I know it's just hard sci-fi, right? But, yeah, but I mean, it's kind of cyberpunk. Like you, like the, the Tleilaxu and the, um, uh, even the Mentats are kind of a version of cyber of cyberpunk. You know. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, love Dune. No man, a Dune deep dive would be great. Oh, dude, I would, I would, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> we should, but we should hang on to that one until the movie comes yep. out. Yeah. Um, 
So um, I'm going to think about that. Is Revelation that I, I want to say it is. It is. I think it is in the long run. The question is like, is it allowed to be? It's that question about violence, right? It's, a, it's that question about destruction is, you know, when we think about it in terms of white supremacy, if there is a solar punk future of a non-white supremacist world, then it's going to necessarily involve the destruction of the former things, right? And right. that the ultimate vision of, you know, of, jo of Revelation 20 and 21 is solar punk. It is, it is, it is hope. It is, it is, it is a hope filled God with us recreated, reformed, blessed world. That, that is hope, right? So, so that is solar punk, but the mo the mode to get there, does that still count? And I don't think I have a broad enough understanding of what, uh, what, what the genre is. Well, and I think getting back to this is somewhat related to the Star Trek question, because in the in the mythology of Star Trek is the great horror that presages right. humanity's enlightenment and its move toward being a warp capable species. And so that and that kind of relates to this this little axiom I've developed over the years is to say that the demon always comes out kicking and screaming that when we do the work of expunging demonic forces it's always going to be ugly yeah. because the demonic force does not want to go. Right. Um, and I, I think that's what we're seeing right now with the kicking and screaming around, you know, Confederate statues. And I mean, people getting upset about Aunt Jemima syrup. Yeah. I mean, yeah, come on, man. But it's also, I mean, I it's think the most it's the right. conservative it's thing on the planet. A private company realizes they make more money if they change this thing. <laughs> But it's rooted in what it is is it's rooted in, in, in ignorance, right? It's rooted yeah. in it's rooted in like you don't realize that this is connected to minstrelsy, right? And to um, problematic depictions of of people of color, right? Like that's it it and, and not being and it's again it's exactly what what we said earlier. It's about it's it's the closing off of one's perspective to understand that the way that you see the world is the only thing. If you were able to open it up and say. I'm having a reaction to this. Recognize that reaction and say, and, and interrogate that and say, where is that coming from? Is it possible that I'm not able to see this whole picture? What am I missing? And that that perspective on the world has something to teach me. Right. You're, you're not going to get anywhere. Well, right. And, what, and, and getting back to the revelation thing, right? I mean, the word apocalypse is unveiling. Right. Which gets yeah. back to the gospel reading we just had this past Sunday. Nothing will be. Nothing that's covered won't be uncovered, right? It's all about an unveiling, yep. all about a revealing. Yep. And so, yep. the idea that, you know, that we we sort of expect God to pull the curtain back, but you know, this big dramatic, right, you know, display, but it might be being pulled back by, you know, black people saying, "Hey, like I'm really pissed off at that statue. Why is it still here?" Right. You know, or like, you know, I'm irritated every time I go to the grocery store to buy rice. You know. Right. Um, that's an unveiling, it's a revealing. And so now the question is, what do you do with it? And, um, and I think, you know, again, like with the solar punk thing, the tools are here. The stuff is here. Like none of it is, it, we, we have the ability to do it. It's just, yeah. can we do it? Do we want to? So. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Solar Punk episode. Um, and uh, it was good having you, Patrick. I'm sure we'll have more of you if you're open yes, to the future. Yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm available. I'm, I, love, I love being here with you. Um, I love sitting in the, guest, in the guest spot and uh, look forward to doing it again. All right, man. Well, you have a good week. Um, and Thanks listeners, well. um, we hope you have a good journey. And that you also like, subscribe, ring bells, shake trees, I, whatever you're doing. Um, and uh, I don't know what the technology stuff is. That's all JG's <laughs> thing. Um, we also have, we're, you know, consider being a patron. We're on Patreon. Um, we want to give a shout out to our patrons who do give us money. We appreciate that. It helps uh, this podcast go. Um, and don't worry, uh, I don't see any of that. So you don't have to worry about supporting me when you subscribe to the Patreon. That's for uh, the the real people. Yeah, well, and it, it also goes to help. It goes to the it goes to the to the podcast is what it goes right. to. So, um, so yeah, and uh, buy your Casper mattresses and uh, <laughs> your uh, your uh, what's the cooking one? Um, blue blue apron. <laughs> blue apron, right? right. All uh, right. All right. Well, good journey. Good journey.